so much for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is uh, Eric Davis. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to be here uh, for this film. This is one of my, my favorite um, films of the year. You know, earlier this year, Steven Spielberg said of Dune and Dune Part Two director Denis Villeneuve uh, that he was one of the great world builders in cinema history which is high praise from Mr. Spielberg, but it's hard to disagree. When you watch a film like Dune, and especially Dune Part Two, um, it is just next level filmmaking, it is next level artistry, it is next level cinema, period. It is big, bold, beautiful, breathtaking, thought-provoking, thrilling entertainment. Um, and when it comes to Dune Part Two, it is the most immersive, cinematic experience that I have had in the theater this year. Um, and I am thrilled that we have Denise and some of the cast here for a little conversation this evening. So let me bring them out now. Beginning with as Fade Rotha, Austin Butler. As Paul Atreides, Timothy Chalamet. The co-writer, producer, and director of Dune and Dune Part Two, the great Denis Villeneuve. The introduction you gave, I mean, it's an almost embarrassing to me. As much as said, I wish we were a musician, that at least you don't have to talk, you just play the guitar. <laughs> you know, let's start, I mean, so many people said Dune was unadaptable. Um, you know, and here we sit here now after you've completed your big screen adaptation of Frank Herbert's novel. Uh, if you can go back to when you, the moment you decided to take this project, what convinced you that you could execute these two films in this way when so many people said, not that it couldn't be done, but that it couldn't be done right, like couldn't be done this way? Well, it's just, a, it's a, maybe I have, I have something missing in me, a, a, a lack of fear, I don't know, but it's, it's just that there are, seriously, there's like, a, a, I was convinced that there was an angle to approach this novel, that it, it was doable. I was like, uh, I had seen the movie in my mind as I was reading the book as a kid, and I, knew, and I was obsessed with those images. And I had not seen those images on screen yet, and I was convinced that someone else would do it for me. Uh, uh, David Lynch tried it, and it, it was a movie that, it was a very interesting movie. There was great things in it, but it was not the Duna I dreamed about. And I, again, uh, I, I was absolutely convinced that uh, somebody else will do it, and nobody did. And uh, at one point, uh, I had an opportunity, uh, and, uh, and uh, I felt ready. I always done projects in my life, trying to not do too much steps in between each projects, each projects um, prepping me for the next one in some ways. So that, that's that's how I feel. I, I felt I was ready. You know, Timothy, you've been on this journey with Denis for these two films, and in fact, this was your first time returning to a film set to play a character for a second time. And I feel like if Dune is you kind of dipping your toes in the water and getting to know Paul, Dune Part Two is you diving into the deep end, very much so. Can you talk about the journey and the challenges of playing Paul in the second film and portraying a man who's kind of stuck between, you know, what he wants to do and, and what he needs to do? Yeah, I think the first movie is sort of uh, laying the foundation for what's to come in the second movie. The first movie is very much a young man who's uh, literally sheltered and living a, a royal lifestyle behind walls. And the second movie, as you said, is not only becoming a man and an adult, but also taking on, uh, taking on a leadership role and not shying from destiny. Maybe it's a destiny you don't necessarily want to embrace and everything that comes with it, you know, losing those close to you 
losing Chani. Um, no spoiler, but I guess everybody just watched it. <laughs> <laughs> spoilers. Been out for like <laughs> six months. <or> <laughs> Zendaya, you know, you're very much, Chani's very much Paul's counterpart in this film. What I love about your performance in this film is that it's so expressive. You know, Chani's a warrior. She isn't afraid to stand up for what she believes and who she believes in. There's so many quiet moments in this film where everything you need to know about what she's going through is, is on her face and, and in her eyes. And, you know, talk about the conversations that maybe you had with Denise in terms of you know, portraying the layers of Chani throughout this film. Because I know in the first one you were there for a hot minute, but this one is all for a hot minute. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I honestly I felt incredibly grateful that I got the opportunity to come back and do it uh, again and have more time with all these people because I did have such a beautiful time the first time around. It was literally a week of work and it was like one of the best weeks ever. And I felt so welcome and safe and I just got a taste of what it was like to work with Denny, to work with everyone, and I was like, do that again. We had a lot of fun. And, um, uh, you know, this time around, again, I think at the heart of it, there is a love story. And it was like with all these massive, massive stakes, um, the amount of weight I think these characters are carrying, how do we make sure we, we still honor a love story and find that? And how do we even, how are we even going to find the time to do that? <laughs> you know? Um, and I think something Denny talked about from the beginning was, uh, he would do this thing like glance passes, and he was like, I just want you guys to look at each other in the scene from like across the way. I might not use it, but I just have it. And it, and it allowed for us to like have these little key kind of touch points in their relationship that you see it building, you see these little looks between them, and you you um, you can really do so much, I think, and, and say so much with nothing at all. Uh, sometimes words fail and words aren't enough, and, um, and I don't know, I, I really enjoyed kind of finding and, and building these things out um, just in glances and in moments between these two people who I think are ultimately, I don't know, bound together, but like uh, constantly, uh, uh, I don't know, trying to figure it out and then debating whether this is the right thing to do or not and, and, and kind of always trying to do the right thing by themselves but by, I think, the greater good, you know, whether it be Paul, whether it be Chani, they're always internally divided, um, and I think sometimes words aren't enough to express that, sometimes it's it's said through other things, so I appreciated the space to find those moments together. Oh, thanks. <laughs> I was kind of nervous when we were talking about, like, we haven't done press for this movie in a long time, so we're like, we're rusty. <laughs> If we ramble and it's like not the most eloquent, I'm so, so sorry, um, but thank you. <laughs> no, everything is great. You know, Austin, you you described this role as delicious, which I love because when I watch it, I'm like, you are eating the whole meal here, man. Um, but I, you know, he is, fate is, is, is maniacal, he's a madman, he's psychotic, um, but you find a way, no, but you find a way, there, it's easy to, to, to go over the top with a role like that. It's easy to kind of glance into like camp zone, but you find a way to ground him in like a vulnerability, and maybe it's a sexual vulnerability like they say in this film, but you find a way to kind of ground him so that way he is intimidating and scary and not over the top, even though his actions are over the top. And I'm curious, like, as you were getting ready to, to, to take on this role, was there something you watched or something you read or something Denise said that where it just clicked and you're like, I know exactly how to play it? I mean, it really, it all started with those conversations between myself and Denise and, and, and you talked about how primal he was and, and then I started looking at animals and started thinking about how, uh, how animals can do incredibly violent things, but they, you know, they're not viewing it as that they're evil, you know. They can rip, rip another animal apart and not have. Uh, it's not like they're they're the bad guy, you know, in their own mind. And, and so it was, it was just finding certain um, certain keys in. You know, one that Denise told me that I've never talked about that I love was testing the knife on that uh, the girl in the first scene. And and Denise said it's like you're. Testing a pen, 
Yeah. It's like that's how much you care. And, you know, and just that image, then then you just imagine that you're testing a pen on somebody. You know, and, and little things like that, so then it's not because uh, I need to know how sharp this knife is, and you know, so things like that to where it wasn't, I wasn't viewing. And that's when it, when it became fun, you know, or, or when you, you know, end somebody else's life, but you see it as you're <laughs> doing it like you're killing a mosquito or something, you know. And uh, so it's just finding those those ways into where it wasn't me seeing him as evil, and that's when it became. Uh, very fun, and then and it was, yeah, I mean, it was really, it was so fun in the beginning part, because we didn't know how he would speak or move, or, um, I remember a time where I thought of him more, you know, I thought, wow, is he, is he like a swashbuckler, is he, you know, does he move very gracefully, and, and then as we talked more and more, that it became more of like a train moving forward, with this brutish strength to him, and, um, and then, what was really cool to see was the stronger that Faye became and the stronger that Paul was, you know, in their in their fight. And, um, and then, yeah, it was all the training that we did with the with the knives as, as well, and all the time that Timothy and I had to train together. It was a day there filming the whole thing. <laughs> yes. I want to talk about that scene in a minute, but first, you know, Timothy said something earlier this year, Denise where he was talking about what it's like to, to film, you know, do and do part two. And he said uh, that you, you bring this indie sensibility to big movie making. And so I'm curious about that and how you take like, you know, um, the spontaneity, the intimacy, the bold risk taking of an indie film and you fold it into this big budget blockbuster movie making film shot entirely on IMAX. Like, can you speak to that a little bit? Um, yes, but it's it's uh, I'm paid for that. I mean, the idea to, <laughs> to create around the camera uh, a, a safe space for my friends. And as a as a uh, director, I, I can say, look at them. I, I'm the luckiest one. I mean, I have the, the chance to work with a fantastic artist, and, and I'm trying to to create a, a safe space around the camera, like uh, I was doing when I, I had. Uh, a uh, smaller crew, the, I try to, to view or to, to keep that spirit, that in the spirit on, on, on set, that, that, which is to uh, uh, protect intimacy. Uh, and uh, I love to work in silence and, and um, to work with a single camera. And, and to just, it's the way I, I work and I try to bring that into it. So it's more like you have that unit around it, it's bigger, there's more space between my car and the camera, <laughs> and I have to walk the more people around, but I'm, I sh I'm shielded for, uh, from that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm focusing it just around the, the camera, so I yeah. um, Sorry, my answer is not very interesting. <laughs> no, but I mean, typically maybe you can, you, you can speak to it too, in terms of like, what's that like for you on a set? You know, you, you've been in a film, you've been in big blockbusters. You know, what, what is that experience like on, on Denise's set? How is it so different? This feels like a big indie film. I was talking about it with Denise today because I, in the interim between when we did press for this and uh, in this moment, I guess, I had gone back and watched Sicario and Prisoners. I was talking about him today. I was just blown away that he has that dual sensibility. You could speak to it, and film professors could speak to it way better than I could. But so when you're on this huge movie like Dune, I feel like Denise somehow has a superpower where he's taking care of these massive set pieces and concepts that are way above our our <laughs> skill level. <laughs> and uh, and otherwise, uh, when it comes time to do a, an intimate scene between Paul and Chani or the scene with Christopher Walken and I at the end, there's a real indie sensibility in that you know you, you try different things, you see what works. Obviously within the world of Doom and fitting the tone. And uh, and also I think it speaks, well, to be quiet, but it speaks to Denise's passion when I say like an indie sensibility that it's not like the day ends and he's in his car, uh, you know, going home right away. I mean, he's like living and breathing it. It's part of the gift of shooting these things in Hungary and all over the world where we did. You're not in New York or LA. In other words, you're, you're really sequestered in the environment that you're shooting in with the family that you've, that we've created, you know? Uh, I don't know if that answers it at all. Yeah. 
You know, there's a couple of sequences I'd love to touch on. Um, I mean, there's so many amazing sequences in this film. I'd love to break down with you. But like Denis, when you when you have the the you know when Paul rides the Sandworm for the first time, you have a scene like that on paper. You don't strike me as a man that's scared of a scene, but on paper, was that an intimidating scene in terms of like how am I going to figure out how to how to shoot this? But you know, it's like um, I uh, I have to uh, I have to create uh, the way. I mean, it was described in the book, but you have in the book that you have to fill the gap between the words. You know, when you bring the this, the thing like that in, in the images, uh, I had to uh, develop a, a lot of part of the techniques. So you jump in the morning, the storyboard, I explain to the crew, I explain how I had a, a plan how to shoot that. Uh, I didn't want to make any compromises. Um, and uh, but you know what? I, I uh, the key is to surround yourself with the best. I had fantastic uh, uh, people around me, Greg Fraser, Paul Lambert, uh, Gurdon at Dessert, that, that, that they are like tremendous artists that helped me to bring uh, um, my dream to, to, to the screen, you know, and that's, uh, of course it's scary, but, um, you know, uh, we had the right technique to do it, yeah. The key for Dune is to use natural light. We, we used uh, natural light as much as possible every time we could, and, and Greg was a strong believer in this too, and uh, we didn't compromise on this yet. Yeah. You know, Zendaya, both you and Timothy ride the same room in this film, and you know, there's seeing that scene on paper, there's filming it, and then there's seeing the, the final product. I mean, what surprised you the most about filming those scenes with the same room? Um, I think, to be honest, I think one thing that I was always so um, like enamored by and with is, is the set pieces. I think uh, being able to be in in these massive, beautiful sets that w with such detail. I remember going in like one of the first days um, into the siege and like all the little inscriptions um, that are on the walls and like uh, they they tell the story of you know it, it's there's so much detail and it's so uh, delicious, if you will. Um, <laughs> but it is, it really makes you feel like you, you know, you're, you're in this, you know, this, this universe, this world. Um, and it, it takes away, you know, a lot of the, uh, uh, the acting really, because the only thing I have to really not think about is like, wow, this is so cool. And be like, oh yeah, I live here, you know? <laughs> I have to not be so, you know, surprised and shocked and, and, and in awe of it, um, but it is really uh, quite quite magical. I think, like you said, surrounding yourself with like these incredible people, but everything from the costumes to the set pieces, like you feel like you are so deeply in this world. And so, to me, every day that we got to do these massive sequences in these places, I just was like, I felt very lucky to be surrounded by this artistry from head to toe. You know, these people that are. Are I think just as important to the development of the character of Chani as I am, right? It, like it, it changes the way you walk, it changes the way you talk, it changes the way you feel. Um, so I, I think being you know in love with that and uh, and also just like the amount of preparation. I mean like the the storyboard, like being able to like come into Denny's tent. And he's like, okay, so this is what we're doing. You know what I mean? And it's very you know there's there's such again, care and detail and structure, and, and you're like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I have I have a mission, I gotta look cool, like, you know, and you know what the shot's gonna be, and that uh, is, is, uh, is, is so important. So I think the team that is, that is around us, that is working so hard and, and cares so deeply about what they're creating um, makes, makes our job that much more special and easy. <laughs> You know, I, I, we're going to come to the audience for a couple of questions, but I'd just love to dive into that the duel scene, that finale, because all three of you were in it. It is a phenomenal sequence. And Austin, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, there's the choreography of that of that fight, but there's also sort of the performance of it. I mean, you're in front of a group of people. Uh, talk, talk about filming that scene in, in, in a way that it feel like live theater because you have all of these people watching. Absolutely. Live theater in front of... Uh, many of your favorite actors in the world, you know, <laughs> your favorite filmmaker, you know, so it was, uh, there was a huge amount of respect that, I mean, I, you know, I think we, we kind of talked about this, when you're around all these people you respect so much that uh, it imbues you with quite a lot of focus and energy, and we'd done so much preparation beforehand on that that when the time came, it was, uh, uh, it was, it was like a racehorse when they finally, 
release the gates and you just can you can let all that energy out. It was it was uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, Timothy worked so hard. It was so cool to to get to work with somebody who was such a hard worker. Love that. Like, there's, there's an energy in that fight where you can tell, like, you're just kind of being let loose, and there's that energy. I mean, what, from your perspective, what was that? Well, I was just thinking, why was I shaking my hand? He said I worked hard, and I shook my hand. <laughs> <laughs> why am I disagreeing? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but, uh, no, I, man, but I feel like I agree with everything Austin said. We're, you know, acting in front of these heavyweights and, you know, present heavyweights and you know, past legends or current legends, and uh, rare to have a, an action sequence in 2024 that's practical, almost entirely practically shot, in fact, I think it was, and that has like great narrative stakes within the story, and with clear beats within the fight, which is, a, you know, thanks to our fight coordinator, Roger Yuan, where you feel Chani tied in, or you feel uh, Princess Irulan tied in, so it's not just two guys wailing on each other, and I'm proud of it too, I think it speaks to Denis and Austin, that there, there are genuine, tremendous stakes in that fight. In other words, it doesn't follow this cliche where you're like, oh, okay, well this character's been central in the first movie to the second movie, he's probably gonna win this fight. You somehow believe, oh, he might, he might get his ass kicked, and he takes two stabs to the, to the gut, you know, the chest. So, uh, yeah, as in they said, this is such a tremendous group effort. We get to sit up here and get the shine in some way, but I wish everyone could see it. I mean, you get a sense of it in the credits, how much of a village goes into this, how many people work hard, you know, and give it their all. And Zendaya, you know, I, what's so brilliant about your performance is that I feel like there's a stretch at that end of the film where you have a line, um, and it's incredible. And so like, everything that you're going through, the most devastating part of her story in this film, you don't have a line, and so it's all on the face, which I think is incredible, and, and as well as that last shot. So I'd love to kind of get, you know, how you prepared for that scene, and, and also that last shot. Like, did you know that that was gonna be the last shot of the film? And, and just kind of, because that last shot, the whole weight of the story is in your face, and I think it's a phenomenal final shot of the film. So I just talk about preparing for that, and yeah. I, I was quite uh, nervous about that because it was written and I was like, shit, <laughs> I'm going to deliver here. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think what, what's difficult about the, the character of Chani in general is that she's a warrior, right? She's literally not allowed to cry. I mean, crying is, you know, you don't waste your water on the dead. You don't waste your water. Water is too precious to cry. So it's like, okay, well, how do I how do I emote to them? Like, how do I give the feeling? I mean, she's heartbroken, but yet I'm not allowed to like do the thing you would do is cry. Um, so um, I think it was just about like, uh, you know, it's like that feeling of like, you feel it and you're just like pushing it down and pushing it down and choking it down and you won't let yourself um, feel, which I think any human at some point has done. Like, you just start like, no, nah, I'm good, I'm good. And I know I did that many, many times in life. I'm like, I'm good, you know? So I just had to kind of pull that out. And also it was like, I think it was like one of the last shots of like, for me at all. So I think it was my final day. So I was already like super emotional anyway, because it was, you know, we were wrapping up and it was, um, I just was so grateful for the experience. And it was like all kind of hitting at the same time anyway. So I kind of got to use that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> I also jokingly, but truthfully, when I was a kid, I, my first acting performance was as a silkworm in James and John Peach. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no lines, okay? So really, that prepared me, okay? <laughs> okay, there's no such thing, small parts, okay? Um, um, but yeah, I mean, jokingly, but, but it is true. I think again, back to the thing of like, you know, uh, there's so much that can be said and done. And so I'm, I'm grateful for the space that, you know, Denny allowed for, um, for those moments to happen. Yeah. No, and it is incredible. And even though you don't have any lines, the whole audience is with you in that scene. Yeah, but isn't it like go cinema? I mean, for watching someone experience something without words, the words are for, from another medium. For me, it's like, uh, I love to shoot, sorry, I interrupt you. No, 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 no. To, to see someone listening. I think for me it's fascinating to shoot someone who is listening to somebody else, to see the impact on the, of the words, or the action, or there's something very cinematic about that. 
And I, I was really excited to have that point of view developed at the end through Shen's eyes. Um, any questions? Do yeah, something I want to say. Uh, I, would, I would like, before you, you start your question, you know, I would like to pay homage to you guys because it's something that I never mentioned in any Q&As or press or whatever is the amount of pressure that Greg Fraser and I put on their shoulders in different uh, ways. I mean, like uh, Austin, at the beginning, when the, he, does, he does the fight, at the beginning, uh, the gladiator fight, we put him in a box uh, uh, to emulate the arena uh, that was like outside, working with that. It was like 50 degrees Celsius or something like that. And what we, would, we cooked alive in that, in that <laughs> box. And, and because I wanted a specific light, and we did it gracefully, the same for uh, Zendaya and Timothy, who were working in the desert, uh, like doing the slough scene, at a specific time of the day, uh, we had to do that scene many times at different, uh, for different angles, different position of, uh, on, the, on different days, many days to shoot that scene at a specific time uh, because Greg and I didn't want to compromise on the light, but that means you have to work with incredibly talented actors that will be able to put themselves back into the, 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 the zone, the emotional zone, you know, like the opening scene was shot like something like <clears throat> 12 or 14 different locations to go. So I'm just saying, I, was, I just want to say thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's crazy what they've done. It's crazy. No, it is. It's wild. Okay, questions? Yes, sir. I'm sure. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. For, for, for the name, how did you manage to not get overwhelmed through every stage as you were you know, writing and storyboarding and shooting? How did you handle that pressure? The question is, how did Denis manage to not be overwhelmed throughout this entire process? I, I don't allow myself to be uh, overwhelmed because <laughs> if I get overwhelmed, the boat will sink. <laughs> and, and, and as a director, I, I have to, that's part of the job to, uh, to deal with the pressure. And to, uh, so the key is to uh, sleep well. <laughs> to, to know what I have, I, I, I uh, developed through the years a, a, a capacity to disconnect. I'm serious. You have to sleep well <laughs> on a movie like that. It's like a, have good hours and, and feel fresh every morning and and, uh, and be prepared. Yeah, I'd say it's like a, I don't know which director who said never take a camera if you don't know what you are about to say with that camera. <laughs> So it's like, a, yeah, you have to be well prepared as the key, otherwise you uh, will be crushed, yeah. Yes. Uh, let's go, anybody in the back? I think it's Godard. I think it's Godard. Jean-Luc Godard. <laughs> back, back, up here. Anybody? Yes, sir, right there. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, you. Oh, my phone. Um, this question can be for anybody. Um, the film is such a potent warning against what happens whenever you can become so involved in a sense of self feeling like you are set above or chosen. Um, and, you know, obviously, by dint of your own talents, you have each kind of, you know, gained a certain level of, 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 of following, for lack of a better term. And I'm, you know, not trying to accuse anyone of having a messianic complex, but I'm curious if, <laughs> I'm curious if the film gives you, any of you, a, a lens through which to uh, you know, evaluate what it means to have fame attract fandoms. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, you got come on. <laughs> Go ahead. What was, the what was the point of um, relation to the movie in the question? I think there was one, but now I'm not remembering it. Um, just, you know, Paul's arc is very much a, a warning against what can happen whenever you can become, get high on your own supply, for lack of a better term, sometimes. Yeah. If I start answering, you guys can answer too, though. <laughs> I'll be back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just give, give me a look. Me a look. But he's right. I mean, that's in that moment with Gurney, when Gurney's like, you have all of this. How right. You don't well, lose? my life is definitely not like that. <laughs> you know, um, not yet. No, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I couldn't, I honestly, it's not a dodge, I couldn't answer that from a subjective point of view. I could say, from an objective point of view, 
I would almost disagree with the notion that that's as prevalent a phenomenon now. I feel like maybe before the internet, or you think in the 40s or the 60s, or when this book was written in the 60s, that cult of personality, if people weren't so accessible, their ideas or their messaging or their music or their films carried first as opposed to a public persona, if that makes any sense. So I would almost, the way I would like, I don't know, I don't know if it's as relevant now, save for a few, I don't know, maybe like actual political leaders. That's how I look at it. That was good. Well said, well said. Solid. Solid. Come on, Z, get in there. <laughs> oh, I mean, I guess, I guess to, to what you're saying, I, I, I feel like often, I'm, I am not cut out for that part of it. You know, I do love my job, I'm so grateful. I, I love doing the work, I love being on the set. I do love moments like this, don't get me wrong, but I, but I am terrified of that part of it often. I was a shy kid, always have been, and so this part isn't natural. That is a huge reason why like fashion became important to me because it became like armor to pretend to go out and do the job. Um, so I, I don't know if I either can fully you know, uh, relate, but I understand, I, I, I definitely understand what you're saying and I think that's what's terrifying to me. I, I, I would like to be a person and, and people to see me as that first and um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily know if I want or can handle all of that. Or want, you know, some people, that's that's part of it. They enjoy the power and what comes with it. And I don't know if that's for me. <laughs> I don't know if that's for me. Uh, one more, yes. I genuinely don't have anything to add to that. You guys said it. I, I was a shy kid as well. I, I <laughs> yeah, that's why I got into fashion. That's all I can say about that. <laughs> yes, right here, yeah. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here and for sharing space with us. I just had a really quick question, it might be silly, but in the world of Dune, there's this language, and I don't know if it's like made up, obviously it's like their home language for the people. So I'm curious as actors and as a director, is this language written as like gibberish in the script or are there certain keywords that the actors are taught? And then if it is a made up language, what is your cue as an actor to continue on with the scene? That's a great question. But I will say that uh, uh, we hired for a part one and part two a, a linguist, a guy that specialized in the, uh, creating new languages, David Peterson, that actually created chapters. So, so yeah, we, we had clues in the book, there was like words, we, and he extended the language and he created a real syntax, a real vocabulary, uh, uh, and a real way to pronounce. So they went to Shakovsa school, actually. They, they, he, he wrote, uh, he translated uh, the part of the script that I wanted in Shakovsa, and these words were, uh, he was explaining uh, to them how to pronounce. Uh, and I was reading, there was a diet coach on set to check the pronunciation. It went to a point where it became mad when I had a great shot. And, and then Fabien was coming and said, actually, you don't pronounce it exactly correctly. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was, it was, it, it, it took it so seriously. So seriously. It was beautiful. It was really moving for me, the, how, how much all the cast, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, there was many times I looked at you have that anecdote where Fabien would give me a note and I would kind of, and then I would go, wait, but this, this is made up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and whoever did come up with the, I think it was Fabian's partner, but I was reading somewhere in the New Yorker or something that he actually has made languages for House of the Dragon and, uh, and other contemporaries. He's sort of the go-to linguist um, who comes up with languages for, for projects. I will say too, I don't know if this is true for you, but I did feel like when I was speaking the Chakopsa, I felt more like um, sometimes speaking uh, in this as Chani, but in English felt more foreign than speaking like the language. Like sometimes it felt more uh, natural to speak in this in this lang in this language in Chikopsa, um, uh, because I almost felt like it, when we were doing our scenes, a lot a, a, we, a lot of a thing that we were trying to figure out often was like how do how do these kids flirt? <laughs> like how do these these like how does a space warrior like fall in love for the first time? Like how how what is that conversation like? 
And honestly, it was difficult to try to figure out how she would speak to him. Um, whereas in Chikosa, I felt like I didn't have to think about those things in those moments with Suela, who's amazing, who um, plays Shishakli. Like, it just feels like it's like, it's just coming out of her. And whereas when the English, I almost think probably for her too, she's having to focus a bit more. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's 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 beautiful what they what they created. And um, yeah, I felt very lucky to have set their, their creation. I think it, it helped a lot. Yeah, and it was precise to a point where even if, for instance, Shen's character says at one point to, to uh, 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 Javier Bardem's character, she said, you're crazy. But that's not exactly what she says in Chakopsa. In Chakopsa, the character says, you're drinking sand. Because a Fremen that, some, a Fremen that will drink sand is insane. So it's, it's all that was in, inside, embedded, hidden, hidden in the, the language itself, a beautiful poetry. And that, I think, the amount of, of work. So it, yeah, they took that really seriously. <laughs> yeah, also just last bit, just in regards to the script, it was in English, there was a translation in italics. And that whole big speech, that Jacob's speech that, that Paul has uh, sort of declaring himself, this in the we shot that in English, right? And we shot it in different ways, you know? And the Jacobsa is what landed in the movie. And I was secretly hoping on the day that it was gonna land in the movie. So I spent six months memorizing it. <laughs> 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 but, uh, yeah. That's incredible. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, maybe the film is doing part two. <laughs> Thank you.